Look at my body. With that, my sister-in-law began to take off her clothes in my room. I was confused as one piece of clothing after another fell onto the bed. A shirt made of soft-looking material, then pants and underwear, and more clothes just piled up. No, wait a minute. I panicked and tried to stop her, but she didn't stop her hands. I couldn't bear it any longer and shut my eyes tightly. It became quiet, and I realized that the last piece of clothing had been removed. Finally, when she was completely naked, she said to me again, Please. Look. I am Luke, a 32-year-old office worker, and I have one older brother. My brother Jack and his wife Emily have been childhood friends since we were young, and the three of us often played together. Five years ago, Jack and Emily got married, and a year later, they were blessed with a daughter named Stella. Despite the changing dynamics, the closeness between Emily and me remained the same, and we often went out together with Stella when Jack was busy. Little did I know that things would turn out like this. It all started on the day Emily took off her clothes. At the sound of Emily's voice, which seemed to be in pain, I prepared myself and slowly opened my eyes. What? To my surprise, I couldn't hide my shock. Emily has red-black scars and purple bruises on her pale skin. Even to an amateur eye, there were plenty of them, ranging from old to new, too numerous to count. Clearly, these were not naturally occurring, and I was taken aback. What happened? Those marks! When I asked hesitantly, there was a moment of silence, and she seemed to struggle with how to convey it. After about two minutes, Emily tearfully whispered, It was done by Jack, your brother. At first, I couldn't comprehend it. Slowly piecing together the meaning of her words, I was simultaneously shocked. Jack did that? Certainly, Jack had been the type to lose his temper and throw punches during childhood fights, leaving me covered in bruises. For a moment, painful memories flashed through my mind, but that was when we were kids. As he grew older, he mellowed out, and the idea of him being violent toward a woman, especially Emily, our childhood friend and now his wife, was unthinkable. For about a year now, it's been happening every day. At first, I thought it was stress from work and parenting. The situation escalated day by day, and she started receiving verbal abuse regularly. I couldn't bear it anymore. Emily continued. Today, that person forcibly kicked me out. I couldn't bring my daughter with me. With no other family, it's just you, Luke. Emily lost her parents early on and was raised by her grandparents. However, recently, her grandparents passed away, leaving only me and Jack as her family. That's why I couldn't believe Jack would do such a thing to Emily who had been like a true family member since childhood. It's hard to suddenly say something like this, but I have no one else to rely on. I was shocked and couldn't find words. Although he usually helped with household chores and parenting, there was a sudden switch in his behavior. Having experienced similar harm from Jack during my own childhood, I found Emily's words credible. I covered her trembling shoulders with a blanket. I've endured it because I didn't want to take my daughter's father away, but I've reached my limit. She said tearfully. Why is he doing this to Emily, who sacrificed herself to protect her child? Yet, at the same time, I felt pathetic for not knowing anything for a whole year. I went through something similar as a child too. I believe you, Emily. I'm sorry I didn't know this sooner. Luke isn't at fault. 
I'm also to blame for hiding it. Emily, with tears in her eyes, looked truly distressed. I'll find a way to save Emily. And I can't let Jack continue like this. Feeling strongly in my heart, I shared a plan. Emily, it might be tough, but will you give it your best? Emily looked directly into my eyes and nodded quietly. However, conflicting feelings about trusting Jack still swirled within me. Two weeks later, Jack suddenly visited my house. When I saw Jack's face, I remembered Emily, and anger threatened to overwhelm me, but we were still in the middle of that plan. I deliberately feigned calmness. Jack threw his legs onto the table and sat down. Hey! Jack had been silent since arriving home, and now he began speaking in an irritable tone. Emily came to your place two weeks ago, right? What were you doing? I couldn't hide my surprise. Emily had later told me she hadn't revealed her whereabouts that night, so how did he know she was here? Look at this! On Jack's smartphone screen, there was a red dot displayed on what seemed like a map. It was the kind you often see in movies. It's GPS. I put it on Emily because I love her. And yet, her affair partner turns out to be my own brother. Apparently, I was suspected of being Emily's affair partner. Jack expressed love for Emily, but it seemed more like possessiveness. Concealing my agitation and anger, I denied it. No, it's not like that. That day, I was discussing Stella's situation. Ouch! Suddenly, a dull sound echoed, and the taste of blood filled my mouth. A few seconds later, I realized I'd been punched. Don't play dumb. Emily's erased all the emails between you two. Clearly, it's an affair. Deleting the email history was something I asked Emily to do. We couldn't risk Jack discovering our plan. And judging by his behavior, it seemed to be working. Listen, if you make any suspicious moves again or tell anyone about today, it won't end well. Jack said this, kicked the trash can in the room, and left the house. My cheek throbbed from the blow. Jack, now an adult, packed a punch far beyond what he did during our childhood. I trembled with anger, wondering how Emily endured this. That night, Emily called me. Jack was apparently out, and she timed her call carefully. Jack gleefully talked about hitting you. I didn't know I was being tracked with GPS. I'm sorry. She apologized. It's okay. Besides, we still have our plan, right? After a brief silence, Emily murmured. Thank you. Then she continued. There's something I need to tell you. Stella has been unusually afraid of dark places lately, so I asked her about it. It seems Jack has been locking Stella in the closet. Stella? Yes. When I asked Stella, she said she was too scared to tell me about Dad. I was stunned. Jack seemed to target the times when Emily was away, and it's no wonder she hadn't noticed. Not only his wife, but also their four-year-old daughter endured such cruelty. I must never forgive Jack. That decision echoed in my heart. That's not all. He took away the savings I'd accumulated even before we got married, claiming it was punishment for my affair with you. That's... He even forced me to reveal my account pin. Probably used that money for... Understood. Let's settle this soon. 
Is our plan working as expected? Yes. Then let's execute it soon. With those words, we hung up. The time for revenge against Jack had finally come. Two days later, I called Jack to my house, saying I had something to discuss. Jack, being lazy, was reluctant at first, but when I mentioned it was about Emily, he reluctantly agreed. The plan was to have Emily and Stella evacuate to a safe place after Jack left the house and join the conversation via speakerphone. What's this about? Finally ready to confess your affair with Emily? Jack still thought I was having an affair with Emily and seemed pleased to finally corner me. Despite having repeatedly hit her and going out to have fun himself, he had the nerve to say that. I called you here to talk, Jack. Emily will join us over the phone. First, I want you to see this. I took out a small black device from the desk. It was the same one I had given to Emily the other day. A camera? Yes, a hidden camera. I had it hidden in your house. Jack's face showed a mix of anger, confusion, and panic. He seemed to realize the significance of this. You understand, right? This camera has recorded you hitting Emily and Stella. I'll just destroy it. It's useless. The data is saved on a certain computer. Jack's panic and confusion turned entirely into anger. He stood up roughly and grabbed me by the collar. His pupils were dilated, indicating extreme agitation. You think you can get away with this? Jack started hitting me repeatedly. His punches were heavy, and each blow to my cheek caused a dull pain. When I tried to protect my face, he targeted my ribs. My whole body hurt, and tears welled up in my eyes. But there was a reason I let him do this. Eventually, Jack stopped, seemingly satisfied. Now you see who's in charge? Tell me where the computer is. The one who doesn't understand is you, Jack. Did you think I wouldn't take any precautions after you hit me last time? This is all recorded too. Yes, I had also set up hidden cameras in my own house. Jack clicked his tongue loudly and kicked the chair he had been sitting on. So, you're going to use that video to reform me? The problem isn't me, it's those idiots. He showed no remorse, and hearing him say this in front of Emily, even over the phone, made me no longer see him as family. Jack, the video of you hitting Emily has already been submitted to the police. I said calmly, wiping the blood from my cheek. My plan was to record the daily assaults and report them to the police. I had made Emily endure it to gather evidence. I just reported it to the police, so they'll be here in about 10 minutes. The police? On the other end of the phone, Emily seemed to realize that Jack was physically hurting me and had called the police. Jack was clearly flustered, his face pale, and sweat forming. Then he said, I was wrong. Huh? I promise I won't do it again. He suddenly started apologizing. Jack's abrupt change surprised me. However, I'm apologizing here. Surely Emily will forgive me too, right? And that's what Jack said. In the end, it seemed he was just afraid of police involvement, a despicable person. I won't forgive you. You can't expect forgiveness after what you did to Stella as well. Over the phone, Emily expressed her opinion clearly. It was surprising that Jack thought he could get away with hitting his wife and daughter daily, as long as he apologized. Why? Didn't we promise to love each other no matter what? 
The one who broke that relationship first was probably you. Jack! I don't think of you as my husband anymore. I've asked an acquaintance who's a lawyer to fight thoroughly. Jack, now desperate, was being contradicted by Emily, who had always obeyed him. I'm sorry. I truly am. So, please, spare me from the police. Jack repeated his apologies many times, but neither Emily nor I had any intention of forgiving him. Soon, the sound of sirens echoed, and the police arrived. Please, forgive me. Finally, Jack started crying loudly, desperately clinging to me with a tear-streaked face. I pushed his hand away, and Jack was taken away by the police, closing the curtain on our revenge drama. A year later, Jack faced charges of assault and intimidation based on the evidence we submitted. But even in prison, he caused trouble repeatedly, and his sentence kept getting longer. In addition, he was ordered to pay compensation to Emily and child support for Stella, accumulating significant debt. Jack was estranged from his parents, with no allies left. Emily found a good person who loved her, knowing everything, at her workplace. They promised to marry. This person also had a good relationship with Stella, treating her like a real daughter. Stella gradually recovered from her trauma, and next year, she'll be in elementary school. I'm looking forward to seeing Stella as an elementary school student. How did you like this story? Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Well then, let's see you in the next video. Poor people living on pensions are a nuisance. You should take care of her. Right after our father's funeral, my brother pushed our physically disabled mother onto me. Cut ties with that old woman and feel refreshed. Even my brother's wife laughed, and I couldn't believe their nerves. After all, both of them had received plenty of care from our parents, yet now they're repaying that kindness with cruelty. But if I think about it, this might be lucky. Secretly smiling to myself, I took my mother's hand. My name is Abigail. I'm single and live on my own, but I used to live with my parents. The reason was that my father was ill and needed care, and my mother had mobility issues. However, when my brother Andrew married Savannah, my circumstances changed. As the eldest son, I have responsibilities. So even after marriage, I plan to live at home. It's a way to honor our parents. That's what Andrew said, and he and Savannah started living at our parents' house together. But then Andrew added, You're a younger sister-in-law to Savannah. She's already considerate of me and our parents, so sorry, but having you around is a bit, you understand, right? Though he seemed hesitant to say it aloud, his expression clearly conveyed that I was a bother. Despite this, I stayed at home for a while, enduring the cold treatment from Andrew and Savannah. Above all, I didn't want to show our parents the strained relationship between us. After leaving home, I entrusted my parents' care to Andrew and Savannah, but it worried me considerably. Andrew has always been self-centered, and I couldn't trust his claims of filial piety. As expected, whenever I asked Andrew or Savannah about our father's condition, they gave vague responses. Even straightforward questions that should have been answerable with proper caregiving were met with evasive replies. It became clear that they were pushing all the responsibility for our father's care onto our mother. One evening, after work, I rang the doorbell at our family home, intending to have a proper conversation. Andrew emerged from the entrance. It's too much for mom to handle everything alone especially with her mobility issues. If you're living together, you should share household chores and caregiving. But Andrew quickly retorted, You know we both work. 
We're busy. Even when I suggested living together again, or at least having me visit during the day to help, Andrew's mood soured. He raised his voice, saying, You're annoying. Besides, you've always been cheeky. The nerve of someone who left to butt in. Despite being practically kicked out by Andrew, his words still stung. I decided it was impossible to have a calm discussion with him. So, I retreated with my usual response, we'll talk about this another time. Occasionally, I tried to subtly address the issue with Savannah, Andrew's wife, but her reactions were equally harsh. She said, What? After finally getting you out of here, you're still trying to interfere? Unbelievable. Even though I hadn't made any unreasonable demands or used harsh language, I found myself portrayed as the villain. In the end, I was forbidden from speaking up, yet not allowed inside the house to help. It left me feeling frustrated and helpless. However, the problem doesn't end there. During a phone conversation with my mother, I learned that Andrew sometimes claims to be short on money and doesn't even provide basic living expenses. My mother said, These tough economic times are dreadful. I'm worried. But from my perspective, it seemed absurd. If they're too busy with work to help around the house, surely they can spare some living expenses? Or are they working at such a terrible company? Both of them? My mother remained non-committal, so I resolved to visit our family home again. Yet once more, I wasn't allowed inside. Andrew, who emerged from the entrance, maintained his intimidating demeanor. Dad used to earn a high salary during his working years, and he had a substantial retirement fund. They can live comfortably without contributing to living expenses, he said, unapologetically. I confronted him firmly. That's not the issue. Even savings and retirement funds deplete when used. Besides, how much is left, and at what rate are they spending it? Can you answer that? Andrew's annoyed expression prompted me to continue. Fine, then you contribute the money. Otherwise, keep quiet. Now, go away. His words revealed that his desire to be a dutiful child was merely a facade. In reality, he wanted to exploit our parents for household chores and financial support. Frustrated, I gave up trying to reason with Andrew and called our parents, suggesting they live separately. But my father's illness prevented him from pushing Andrew out, leaving the decision to my mother. Still, she refused to leave the family home, insisting on handling both household chores and caregiving. I know we shouldn't spoil him further, she said. But if we kick him out, won't he cause trouble elsewhere? As the one who raised him, I should take responsibility. I disagreed. No, that's not true. I grew up in the same environment. Andrew's behavior is his own responsibility. It's not your fault. My mother chuckled, seemingly unfazed. Well, for now, apart from my mobility issues, I'm doing fine. If things get tough, I'll rely on you, Abigail. And so, she continued to smile, completely unconcerned. Despite my efforts, even when I tried to give her living expenses directly instead of Andrew, she declined. It left me feeling helpless. Amidst all this, my father's health deteriorated, and before we knew it, he passed away. Despite her grief, my mother dutifully served as the chief mourner, and I did my best to support her. However, I couldn't help but notice Andrew and Savannah, who did nothing. Should I say something, as usual? But I knew they probably wouldn't listen. During the funeral, I remained silent. 
However, after bidding farewell to my father, an unexpected situation unfolded during a meal. The funeral is over, and this poor pensioner is a nuisance. Abigail, you should take care of mom. Startled, I watched as Andrew tried to push my mother out. Aw, finally rid of that bothersome old woman. It feels refreshing. Even Savannah joined in, laughing. Their nerves were beyond belief. What are you saying? Don't you both realize how much you've relied on mom? My anger seemed lost on them. To Andrew, I was just his younger sister, and my words didn't matter. This house is mine now. So anyone I deem unnecessary should leave, right? No, the house was in dad's name, wasn't it? Even if you want the house and other inheritance, we need to discuss it properly. Andrew's shocking statements left me more bewildered than angry. What? What's going on? I asked. It turned out that Andrew had manipulated our ailing father, who lacked judgment, into transferring the house into his name. And the will stipulated that he'd receive all the other inheritance too. Exploiting him while he was vulnerable? I exclaimed. Call it what you want. Results matter. Anyway, that's why mom is now penniless. Just a burden. We didn't want the sick old man in the house, let alone a disabled mother-in-law. Andrew agrees. So pack your bags and leave. Savannah echoed Andrew's sentiments, and I felt a rage that shook me to my core. Looking at it another way, this might be lucky. I'd always thought Andrew and Savannah should live separately from our parents. Now that they were freeing my mother, perhaps this was an opportunity. Besides, I had my own worries, and maybe they could be resolved. My anger from moments ago vanished as I quietly said, Well, I guess there's no other choice. We concluded that there was no need to speak with Andrew and Savannah anymore. After they left, my mother and I sat down for coffee. Mom, if you leave this house, can you live with me? I extended my hand, and she happily accepted. Let's start by moving the essentials. Consider my apartment a temporary residence. Once we find a suitable place, we'll move. Given the stairs and steps in my apartment, it wasn't ideal for my mother's mobility. But she nodded in agreement. Then, she hesitated and made an unexpected proposal, one that surprised me. Still, I immediately agreed, believing it would ensure my mother's peace of mind. Later, we visited our family home together, and I informed Andrew and Savannah that I'd be taking care of my mother. Their joy knew no bounds. Having settled things quickly, we began packing my mother's belongings and preparing for the move. Andrew said, Abigail must really have a soft spot for useless, poor old ladies. With everything going his way, Andrew was grinning from ear to ear. The unhelpful Andrew couple just watched without lifting a finger, and that day my mother and I started living together taking only the necessary items. For the large furniture we couldn't handle ourselves, we decided to hire professionals later. The next day, since I had a day off work and was tired from the move, I overslept a bit. When I woke up, I was surprised. I hadn't noticed because my phone was on silent mode, but Andrew and his wife had left numerous missed calls. Dozens of them, in fact. Just as I was overwhelmed by the unexpected volume, Andrew called again. What's with that photo? As soon as I pressed the answer key, I was met with a furious voice yelling at me, so I instinctively pulled the phone away from my ear. Is that the one I sent yesterday? In reality, 
When we moved, I took a photo of the view from our new place and sent it to Andrew. Since I didn't get an immediate response, I assumed they had gone to bed early or something. Andrew exclaimed. I was shocked this morning. The message said it was your new home, but the view is from some ridiculously high place. There's no way you could take a photo like that anywhere other than a high-rise condo. Did you figure it out? Actually, this place is owned by my mother. I surprised myself when I heard her say that. Andrew laughed, clearly thinking I was joking. Come on, it's obvious you're making this up. Ignoring his skepticism, I continued. After Dad's funeral, you kicked out Mom, who was living on a pension and had mobility issues. So when I suggested we live together, she invited me to her high-rise condo, and we moved in right away. Andrew retorted. You're lying. There's no way that poor old lady owns such a luxurious place. Maybe it was hard for him to believe, just as it was for me when mom first told me. Andrew persisted. Fine. That photo can't really be from your new place. You probably took it somewhere unrelated or found it online. Since he refused to believe me, I reluctantly got permission from mom and decided to invite Andrew and his wife to the high-rise condo's shared lounge. They wouldn't be allowed in unless residents invited them, so that should prove we live here. Andrew said. That's what I wanted. I'll see it with my own eyes. After ending the call, Andrew arrived at the place where we were waiting. Fortunately, there were no other users in the lounge at that moment, so we could talk quietly. Once inside, Andrew and his wife looked around with wide open mouths, seemingly speechless. After seating them, I also took a chair. First, let me clarify something. Neither Andrew nor I knew this, but it turns out that our mother was actually quite wealthy. My mother added, My father, your grandfather, left behind about $100,000. But since it wasn't money I earned myself, I felt embarrassed to talk about it. Despite her embarrassment, my mother said she used that as a starting point for investments and managed to increase it. Even though she's my parent, I never realized how remarkable she was. Recently, she's been investing in real estate, and that's how she acquired this high-rise condo. The reason Andrew and his wife didn't need financial support from us was because of the rental income from the real estate. And the reason they didn't know about it was because our late father had sworn her to secrecy. My father had rented a house and only pretended to have money, he wasn't a high earner, and his retirement savings weren't substantial. While we enjoyed family trips and bought luxurious things, it was my mother who footed the bill. To make matters more complicated, or perhaps straightforward, my father had no intention of leaving an inheritance, he spent all his modest assets himself. So, practically speaking, there's almost no inheritance from dad, I explained. Andrew, who had even written a will, realized it was all for naught and stood there dumbfounded. But I already bought things, assuming I'd get an inheritance. Savannah chimed in. Our savings are practically non-existent. What are we going to do? And Andrew, you took out a loan to buy that luxury car. Andrew retorted. You splurged on designer bags and accessories too. Are your credit card payments okay? As they suddenly started arguing, I exchanged glances with my mother, realizing that the conversation wasn't progressing. Then, with a start, they both turned toward us, closing in. Right. If you have money, you should help us out, shouldn't you? Andrew declared. Savannah added. Of course. Besides, if you're wealthy, the situation changes. Let's live together again. Andrew's forced smile and Savannah's unnatural, 
cloying voice made even my usually composed mother raise an eyebrow. Since I was tired of their nonsensical sleep talk, I decided to confront them with a reality they probably hadn't realized. Andrew, you seem to have forgotten, but if the family home was transferred to your name, there should be a gift tax to consider. Andrew froze at my words and muttered, Tax! It's likely to be higher than inheritance tax. If you don't believe me, look it up on your phone. Andrew scrambled to search. After a while, he exclaimed, Oh! Savannah blinked repeatedly, seemingly unable to tear her eyes away from the screen, and I looked like I might burst out laughing. Our family home is quite spacious, with a decent location, so the property taxes are substantial. A rough estimate suggests it could be over $10,000. And since it's an old house, Finding a buyer might be challenging. Andrew protested. Why do you keep saying weird things? Even if you demolish it and sell only the land, it'll still cost a significant amount. It's quite a hassle, isn't it? I smiled at Andrew and Savannah, who were sweating nervously. I had known this all along, and when my father passed away, I had considered renouncing the inheritance altogether. But Andrew's selfish actions resulted in them taking on everything, which turned out to be lucky for me. While I beamed, Andrew and his wife turned pale. Savannah sighed. Can't you find another solution? I can't think of anything, I replied, puzzled. All I can suggest is... Andrew interrupted. What? Don't try to evade taxes. Penalties will only increase the amount you owe. It's better to sell your prized brand items and pay the taxes quietly. Despite my sincere advice, it wasn't the satisfactory answer they wanted. They frowned and looked dissatisfied. Andrew pleaded. Come on, help us out. We're family. His usual authoritative demeanor had vanished, replaced by desperation. Savannah turned pleading eyes toward me. Watching them, I sighed deeply. Who was it that kicked out this family? Even Andrew faltered at my pointed remark. If Andrew and his wife had shown a cooperative family spirit, I might have been willing to contribute financially, at least partially covering the gift tax. But expecting help only when they were in trouble after abandoning my sick father and even my mother was too much. My mother chimed in. For you too, I'm just a useless, poor woman, right? So there's nothing I can do. Her gentle tone belied her unwavering resolve. It was a smile that conveyed both softness and unyielding determination. Andrew implored. Mom, please. It's a lifelong request. Help us out. Savannah added. We'll treat you well from now on. Please let go of the past. Despite Andrew and Savannah's pitiful expressions, my mother remained steadfast, shaking her head. So, the conversation is over. It's time for you to leave. Andrew protested. Wait! Ask Abigail to talk to Mom, too. We're in a dire situation. My family consists only of Mom. When you kicked us out, the bond was severed. Shall I call security if you won't leave? Realizing our determination, Andrew looked crestfallen, and Savannah collapsed weakly to the floor. They were so shocked that they couldn't move, so we had the security guards escort them out. Afterward, Andrew and his wife sold all their luxury items to pay the gift tax, but their savings were wiped out. With mismatched income and hefty property taxes, they struggled to make ends meet. Andrew, desperate for help, tried to break into the high-rise condo to see mom, but the guards promptly removed him. He even got arrested for resisting. 
Although Andrew was released soon after, they couldn't adjust their lifestyle, accumulating debt until they disappeared without a trace. I no longer cared about their fate. I moved furniture from the apartment to the high-rise condo, and mom bought everything new. We now live happily every day in this barrier-free environment, perfect for my mobility-challenged mother. Seeing her content face, I vowed to continue being a devoted daughter. I hope you enjoyed this story. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Let's see you again in the next video.